This episode of Film Ride is brought to you by Domain.com. Today we're taking a look at the Sony FS7 to see how it stacks up against a camera double its price. Ooh. I know. Welcome to Film Ride, the show that takes the mystery out of the effects and techniques school and some of your favorite Hollywood films. I'm your host, Ryan Conley, and I've been eyeballing the Sony FS7 for a while now, even more lately since I'm looking to purchase a more high quality camera for my production company. I've had my eye on the C300 Mark II, but the problem with that one is it's $16,000, which is a friggin' car, but that price is fine as long as you know the camera's gonna make your money back, plus some, but still, $16,000 is some heavy lifting. But then we have the FS7, which on paper totally holds up to the C300 Mark II, and it's half the cost at $8,000. So I thought it would be interesting to take a look at the FS7 to compare it directly to the C300 Mark II. But before we jump in, because I know there are some cynics watching, neither Sony or Canon had anything to do with this episode. We got both of these cameras thanks to our good friends at Lens Pro to Go. So there is zero influence from the companies. And what follows is my honest and true personal opinion. Business done. Let's do this. Now the first thing I thought when looking at the FS7 is that it looks like a proper cinema camera. Seems like some serious business. And as you can see, I also have Canon glass on there, which I can do using Metabones adapters. Right here on the side, we have our main bulk of external controls, our white balance, shutter, iris, ISO, and so on. ISO and white balance are controlled by these switches here, which I did find a little bit annoying to shoot with. If I wanted it in the middle, often I would flick past it accidentally and pretty easily, but I just might be a terrible switch flipper, who knows. Over here, we have the audio controls, two channels to shoot with, all pretty straightforward. Below that, we have our controls for the menu, which are my enemy, but we'll get to that later. Next to that, we have our memory card slots, which Sony uses XQD memory cards. Then we have the battery, our SDI and HDMI outs, and our XLR inputs. Up here, we have the top handle, very nice and rugged. In front of that, we have the LCD slash viewfinder, which is mounted on currently by the Zakudo Axis Mini, since the way that this comes mounted is pretty flimsy, it seems. If we take the viewfinder off by flipping the latch up here and the same on the bottom, we have our LCD monitor. And to be honest, I'm not a big fan of how the viewfinder works coming off and on. The way that it's mounted seems very flimsy and like it would break or fall off easily enough. And worse than that is the quality of the LCD. In my personal opinion, it's not all that good. I found it really difficult to pull focus without peaking turned on, and I personally don't like to use peaking, so that was a pretty big issue. If I were to use this camera on a regular basis, I would absolutely get rid of it and mount something else like a small HD 502 or a Zakudo Gradical. But on the side of the monitor, we have our selections for contrast peaking and zebra, which is really nice to have there. Then finally, for the outside of the camera, we have have the handle, which is a separate piece on this arm, which you attach to the camera like so. It was actually this setup that made me most excited about this camera, going back to that proper way of holding a cinema style camera on the shoulder and awesomeness, right? No, the center of gravity is too far forward, so all the weight is on your one hand, which becomes tiring very quick. I just found it super uncomfortable to shoot with like that. You'd really have to add weight to the back of the camera to make this work well. It also extends and retracts on the handle arm, but does so with these screws, so you need to have something to work those loose and tight whenever you want to move it. Not great at all if you're in run and gun. The idea of the handle is great though. I really love where Sony's head is at here, but like many of the other things around this camera, I would replace this arm and probably add an extender to make it work like it should. But the grip is great. You have a zoom toggle, record button, user menu button, and joystick, which is a much better way to navigate the menu. Speaking of the menu, let's jump into the internals of this thing. Everyone that I've seen talk about the menus for this camera expresses some kind of less than enthusiastic response to it, and I'd have to agree with them. I'm not a huge fan of how it's laid out or this horrible, horrible shuttle wheel that you use to navigate it on the side. It feels incredibly slow and frustrating to get to anything, which isn't a big deal at first, but when I'm out and trying to shoot, it becomes one. I do feel like a bratty child complaining about it, but I really, really hate that wheel. But like I said before, the joystick on the handle is much better. It does still feel a little bit sluggish when trying to move around the menu options, but much better than the shuttle wheel. The one saving grace to this crazy menu is the user menu where I can put all the things that I need the most often right up top, which is fantastic. There's only a handful of things that I really need to change on the regular, so this function right here actually turns the whole menu around for me and makes me like it. So problem solved. First option I'm gonna go to in the menu is base settings. This is where I can select my shooting mode and color space. The shooting modes, you have two options, custom and Cine EI, which Cine EI is your cinema mode, but the problem with this odd setup is that you're restricted with different functions depending on which one you pick. If you select Cine EI, you can't change the ISO from 2000, which is set there because that's the ISO on this camera that Sony found to deliver the best image. You also can't use a custom white balance. You are locked to either 3200, 4300, or 5500 with no in-between. If you choose custom mode, you don't 
don't get S gamut options or monitor LUTs and you're limited to the matrix color space. Overall, I found separating the modes really frustrating because I wanted something in the middle of those two. But we'll stick with Cine EI. I found that to be the best option for image quality and my shooting style. Now we're gonna go into color space to see our flavors of S log. I'm sticking with S log three Cine. Again, best image in my opinion. Although I did see some people saying that it was too noisy, which is not the case. It looks that way before the grade, but once you've color corrected the image, you'll lose all that extra noise. Now we'll go into codec. I'm shooting all internally, so I'm using the XABCI, but you see here grayed out selections for RAW and ProRes, which you'd need Sony's $2,000 extension unit to use those. To shoot RAW, you would need an external recorder, but ProRes can be recorded internally, which is really awesome, minus the $2,000 extra. After that, we're gonna go into recording format. I'm shooting full 4096, but you also have 3840, and of course, just straight 1080, which you need to be on if you want high speed slow motion. Then we move out again and find another must have for any cinema cam for me, and that is the aspect ratio markers, which we have here, and it's great. You can select a white reference bar or black bars that you can adjust the opacity for. And of course, it doesn't get recorded on your image. It's just reference. The best part is they have 235 and 2.4. Then we have our monitor LUTs, which you can turn on to see a better representation of what your image will look like once graded, which helps make sure you are getting what you want since log is so flat and gross to look at. However, I'll only check it once and then shut it off. But those are the main things in the menu that mattered to me other than sound, of course, which this camera has great internal audio. You could even add two extra channels with another extension unit for a total of four audio channels, which is also great. But now let's take a quick break and then we'll jump into image quality compared to the C300 Mark II. Hey, buddy bear. I have a present for you. For me? You betcha. There are three presents. But only one is yours. Choose. What fun! Is... Is that a half-eaten burrito? You chose... Poorly. Okay. Then... This one. Oh my god! <laughs> yes! What is this? I think you know. Oh god, it's like ground meat! Keep going. It smells it smells like death. Exactly. Used to be Ryan. No. Yeah. You killed Ryan and then put him in a meat grinder? Relax, it was a joke. Murder is a joke! Not to people that have a sense of humor, I guess. <gasps> oh sweet baby lord. Open the last one. No way. Open it, or I gift you next. Okay. Okay. It just says Film Riot. It's a coupon code. You're welcome. I'm confused. Use the coupon code Film Riot at domain.com checkout and you'll get 25% off your order. I know what the coupon Email, code is. Email, web hosting, domain names. No, I know. We talk about this. They have a growing list of 400 plus domain names. I get that, but we do and that. Josh. What? When you think domain names, think domain.com. What are you doing? You're not dead. I'm giving Josh the gift of savings. From domain.com. Yep. It's 25% off when you use the coupon code FILMRIGHT. Now that's Christmas. It sure is. Wait, if Ryan's alive, then who is this? The neighbor. Oh, God. It's a dog. No. It's food. The neighbor's dog food. Oh, thank God. Which also happens to be a cat. Oh, no, the, yeah, that's fine. Nobody likes cats. Yeah. Nobody likes cats. No. Nobody. <laughs> Logo. Main thing when testing out cameras for me is not any scientific sort of approach, but rather how it would fit me as a filmmaker. How does it work in practical situations? And more than anything else, what image quality am I going to be able to pull from this? To test that out, I decided to put it up against the C300 Mark II, which is a far more expensive camera, but also the one that made the most sense to put it against, which is a huge compliment to the FS7. So first thing I tested was just taking these two outside in the sunlight, and I didn't try to match the settings between them. I worked each camera independently to just get the best Best image I possibly could from it. And off the bat, I was incredibly impressed with how well the FS7 held up image-wise to a camera twice its price. I do like the colors a lot more from the Canon C300 and feel like it's getting a more glossy, cleaner image, but it's really not that far off. 
But after some outside tests, I took it inside to throw these cameras under some lights and see what we could get. Again, I was really impressed with the image quality of the FS7. Side by side, you really can't tell which is which. I'm still liking the color from the Canon a lot more, but that is usually the case. Canon really has their color science locked down. And here we have the shots ungraded just in log. If we zoom in here, we see what most people are saying about S-Log being noisy, but that is just due to everything being flattened out and how log works. Once we put the grade back on, you can see that we lose all that noise. But while looking at log, you can see that the FS7 has more noise than the C300. And the FS7's noise is more of a typical video discolored smudgy noise, whereas the C300 has that more tighter, almost grain-like noise. If I jack the sharpening all the way up on both of these images, you can see what I mean. In the FS7, you're getting a lot more color noise and in big blocks. But with the C300, you see you still have some color, but it's more like grain, which is a big help when pushing the image or tracking. Next, we'll look at them both in the blue channel and you can see even more. The Canon is definitely doing a lot better with noise. So far, the C300 Mark II wins hands down when it comes to the image. And as you can tell from the first half functionality, I did a whole review on the C300, which you can find right here. So I won't go into how well it's built in this episode. But let's move on to something that the FS7 does bury the C300 in, and that is slow motion. The high speed slow motion on this camera is really, really great. You of course have to switch into 1080p and then you can record slow motion up to 180 frames per second. And with the external recorder, you can go as high as 240 frames per second. Best part about this is that it isn't cropping in on the sensor like the C300 does. So you have that full frame to play with high speeds and the C300 only even goes up to 120 frames per second. So here, the Sony FS7 definitely wins. Then we move on to low light. Neither of these cameras are A7S level, but they do pretty good in low light situations. We're getting a little bit of the same issue as far as noise with the FS7 here. So the C300 does have the edge for sure, but mostly these two weren't far off. And finally, I did a quick rolling shutter test. The C300 one here as well, but not by that much. The FS7 definitely has some rolling shutter going on, but far less than what you're gonna get from a DSLR style camera. Now, after all that, especially the first half of the episode, I'm sure you'd assume that I don't like the FS7 and you'd be wrong. My final opinion is that this is a really impressive camera for the price. The slow-mo is solid, the image quality is great, and the extension options are really nice to have as well. However, there are a bunch of downsides with this camera for me, and a lot of it just comes down to preference, but for me, I have to spend another three to four thousand dollars on replacements like the viewfinder and the arm extensions to really get this camera where I need it to have it where it's competing with the C300. And even the XQD cards that you need for the Sony are more expensive than the CFAS cards for the C300. Personally, this is not the camera for me. I definitely think it is a solid and viable option for a lot of people. Even Philip Bloom has been using this to shoot incredible footage on the wonder list, but it just has too many quirks that drive me crazy and get in my way. And I really feel like I was fighting the camera constantly. And for me, that's a deal breaker. I'm sure over time I'd get used to it, but I want tools that get out of my way, not give me hurdles. So bottom line, it isn't the camera for me, but I'd absolutely go to it for high-speed recording, and it is without a doubt the best camera in its price range right now. If you're looking for a sub $10,000 camera, this is definitely gonna be your best option. And no, just because I prefer Canon does not mean that they pay me. I have not been paid by Canon. I have never even received free gear from them. I know a lot of people love the FS7, and I'm included in that in an odd dysfunctional relationship sort of way. And if you wanna see a really in-depth review that shows how great of an image you can pull from the FS7, definitely check out Philip Bloom's 50 minute long look at the camera right here. And as always, it is the best review for the camera online. And if you do decide to get this camera, check out this training course right here. I bought it to learn how to use this thing since jumping into it can be pretty confusing at first. But that's it for today. Don't forget about our Triune Secret Santa giveaway, which is over $9,000 worth of goodies. No? Not over, not over 9,000 this time? Nothing? What are you talking about? You can find- Over 9,000! <laughs> you can find info on that right here, and I'll see you guys next week when Dorothy finally works.